So, um, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Thomas Bergwis. I'm the Robert H. and O. Family Foundation Curator of Chinese Art at the Guggenheim Museum in New York. And um, today uh, we're in conversation with Wang Jianwei, uh, an artist who was born in Sichuan, in Suining, in 1958 and moved to Beijing and is currently practicing out of Beijing. And we'll be talking in the context of um, the Robert H. and O. Family Foundation Chinese Art Initiative at the Guggenheim Museum in New York, um, which is a, an initiative that will run uh, over five years. Um, it was launched in 2013 until 2017 in three iterations of commissioned works, so newly developed works by contemporary Chinese artists. And the first exhibition of this initiative, uh, curated by me, um, was the exhibition of Wang Jianwei uh, called Time Temple. It closed on February 16th, um, and um, it was a great project to work on for me, especially because it considered um, newly developed work, uh, so it gave the opportunity to really um, work with an artist and an artist at work. Um, and the works have uh, since then entered in the uh, Robert H. and O. Family Foundation Chinese Art Collection at the Guggenheim Museum in New York. And what you'll see on the background is the slides passing by of the works that were exhibited. In three uh, components, or actually four. Uh, one, an exhibition consisting of sculpture and painting conceived by Wang Jianwei in the development of uh, the initiative of the project. Um, a film that was running in our new media theater um, in the lower level ground of the Guggenheim Museum uh, and specifically uh, developed for our media theater because Wang Jianwei really wanted to show it in a cinematic environment. Um, the morning time disappeared. And then the third component uh, was a two-part performance. Um, the first part was based on a sound installation with performance in the Guggenheim's Rotunda, in the big hole in the Guggenheim Museum. Uh, and it was conceived at the opening of the event um, on October 30th last year, 2014. And that part, um, which involved uh, casted 20 people from across greater New York uh, who were speaking to particular topics that Wang Jianwei identified, which included the, the Guggenheim, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, the universe, MAP, um, as well as Gnosticism, um, themes that Wang Jianwei identified in the context of Time Temple, in the context, uh, context of the exhibition's theme, but also in the context of the Guggenheim Museum, uh, its design, its architecture, as well as its founding statement, um, and contemplated within the condition of universality as well, which we'll talk about a little bit. And then the second part was the closing ceremony of the exhibition. Uh, the exhibition closed on February 16th, and on February 12th and 13th, we had in the uh, lower ground theater of the Guggenheim Museum, we had a two-night theater performance, uh, which was uh, conceived by Wang Jianwei uh, and done with a group of great professionals uh, in terms of uh, five wonderful professional dancers uh, from uh, Beijing, um, Chun Di Li, a, a, a great sound artist, and um, a great light designer as well. Um, and that was a, a two-night event. So that is the entirety of Time Temple in which context we will speak today. But what we also like to consider as we were talking uh, before, and we've talked many times, but also prior to uh, this event, we sat down and we sort of went through several thoughts and th several angles, is we also want to talk about uh, the conditions of culture and identity 
and culture, identity, and politics that has defined much of the interest, and especially also overseas interest in Chinese art. In my experiences studying Chinese art as well, a lot of the discourse around Chinese art often begins with political development, um, as well as social development, and then gradually the author moves into talking about artists. But we're challenging this concept a little bit and saying, are these approaches also really considering contemporary art in the context and condition of China, but also internationally? So we'd like to sort of uh, consider talking about art as well, and with that, about the politics of form, um, which is very important in Wang Jianwei's current practice as well, and how Time Temple was conceived. So I've given an introduction, uh, and this is the time for me to um, raise questions to Wang Jianwei and really have Wang Jianwei speak. And then uh, towards the end, we'll leave some time open for questions uh, from the floor as well. Um, just so you know, I've been told, because the last panel went a little bit over time, we can continue until sec uh, 6, 10, so 10 minutes past 6. Uh, so we'll probably leave the last 15, 10 minutes open for questions. But the first question, which I uh, always consider doing my research as well, uh, and, and where I'd like to start off, is really um, for Wang Jianwei to tell us a little bit more, um, going back to the early days of his life, um, and really for you to consider and to tell us when you first encountered art uh, in your life, and what kind of role and impact did it make on you? So, uh, when uh, well, actually, sometimes, if you compare today's work uh, with uh, work of years ago, that can be something very dangerous to do because uh, this can become quite opportunist, but I'm still willing to talk about it. Actually, I was at the age of 17. I was at the village. Uh, there was really nothing much that you could do at that time. I, and I meant not only um, what kind of activities you can do, uh, what I meant more is that there is really this shut off from uh, the outside world. There was no TV, no books, uh, no, you know, nothing at all. And my friend said, you know, really, you know, if you really can't find anything to do, try to draw or paint. And that was really the start of art for me. But however, what was the real reason for doing this? And uh, it was only after three decades of time have passed when I really got to understand. It is, you know, the fact is that I have chosen art. I was trying to go for a uh, search for things that reality could not provide to me. And this is uh, indeed the uh, question that I face now. With my reality, you know, this is something that it, I find difficult to acknowledge. You know, at the very beginning, my work already incorporates society and politics, and this is a choice that I will have to be responsible for, because my choice is built exactly upon the non-trust or untrust to the uh, current situation. And it involves not only those tangible things, but also those intangible things uh, that are existent in the system. You know, it can be represented in political terms, education terms, or any other terms. Uh, this reality, for me, is uh, something that you can doubt However, uh, it was, to me, a way of working. I think this work is very real to me. 
and this work that was very real to me now has become so simple and yet so difficult today. And what I was really talking about, and what I am really talking about, would be politics. Well, allow me to continue to speak in Mandarin. You know, that would be more convenient. You know, I'm considering the reality at that time included two parts. One would be the revolution, meaning the cultural revolution. No, that was a reality co co composed of culture, politics, as well as uh, reality. So, what did art uh, gave you? You know, how did it impact your life? Was it an alternative for you to face the reality? You know, how what was what was your thoughts at that time? I understand what you're saying. You know, I was talking about you know a entirely closed up society. You know, when a society or you know affords you with no choice, or when you have absolutely no reference for whatever you do. Now, this is the only natural way. And I think this world is very horrible, it's formidable to me. Just now you talked about uh, revolutionary realism. You know, actually, it has been impacting us all along, not only in our vicinity and also far beyond what we can see. I think you were talking about the art during that time. As you may well aware, you know, at that time, art, what was it? You know, it must come from life. It must come from society, right? Now, secondly, uh, art must reflect life. It must reflect the society. Now, what this goes to say is that art is nothing else. There's no art. The art is non-existent. Art can only reflect reality. Art can only reflect on politics. Art can only serve the community. It can only serve politics. Now, what is worse is if this becomes the only way that you can look at things, then it becomes that art can only serve this type of politics. So it is really horrible. Actually, we can see it today. What was the harm that it could bring to everybody, to the society and to us? So I think as a contemporary artist, you know, one in its work, in one's own work, is already challenging this framework. What I meant was that I have to say that my work was not within that realm that was def defined for us. You know, art does exist. Art does. Art is not only a tool. Of course, I cannot stop people from understanding uh, art as only a tool. I think they have a legitimacy of their own. However, I myself, I hope that I can choose art to be not just a tool, not just um, a way to reflect on certain things, you know, certain political reality. Now, this tool, you know, I, th I used to think that our issue has been resolved. However, I think the issue sometimes is worse than I thought it would. It was. Sometimes I would be asked, you know, for example, I have spent a lot of time on a piece of work and participate in an exhibition. And I also see a lot of media and people would ask me a lot of questions. You know, they asked me nothing about what I really cared about. They asked me uh, questions that the media would want to know about the re, uh, about the society, about the politics. Uh, but I, I'm sure that I would face, you know, uh, a, a political or uh, societal issues. You know, I have no uh, intention of evading these challenges. But however, as an artist, I, I too have the right to think of it, this as a, from an artistic perspective. Now, if I don't have this right, then it becomes a truly political issue.
Now, apart from considering art as art at that time, I mean the very early times, your view and your, you know, how do you feel about the society, including whether the society was a homogeneous one and also the exchanges between you yourself and the society and also including uh, what art plays and what role does art plays in this context. Excellent question. You know, I often come into a situation when artists must care, uh, you know, about the uh, society. We, one must, you know, not avoid from staying just in the ivory tower, etc., etc. Now, I recognize this issue very early on, you know, very often when we see a, a, a mother, you know, Faye talks to the TV saying that I don't want my child to become spoiled in this society. You know, I thought that, you know, when I was small, you know, my parents would often say that, you know, do not allow your child to be spoiled in the society. Then I discovered, then I realized that you have to learn to be good from the society. Now, where is this society? You know, how can one learn to be a good person from this society? For example, if one says that we have to be inside a society or to intervene into a society, then my work, you know, is not in a society. You know, I must go somewhere and do something. Then it becomes a society, right? Now, another thing is, you know, this intervention into society, this action. You know, what happens when this action is completed? Then does it mean that I'm no longer in the society? You know, this has become, you know, a, a confusion for me. You know, uh, where is this society? Now, where does my job takes place? Can it be called, you know, a piece of work of the society? Now, this society becomes more and more um, abstract, more and more untouchable. Now, my feeling, my personal feeling is that you know, it can't be true that the society is so untrue. You know, uh, you know uh, I, to me, uh, a society must be touchable. It must be real. You know, it must be, you know, uh, involved in everything that you do. So I think that uh, something that you can touch for a long, long time, something that you can be involved in for a long, long time, you know, uh, it, only at this point can it become your society. It's very hard for us to understand, you know, um, you know, when a doctor stands in front of an operation theater, it cannot be called a society. You know, when a worker works, and you don't you don't call that working in a society when a family sends their children to school and you t you don't call it you know sending uh, children to uh, you know to society and you know an artist work is not in the society you know if that's the case then society becomes abstract becomes untouchable and in the end it becomes it becomes something that is framed it becomes something that only exists within a very special circumstances, very special meaning with a special, you know, uh, expression and form. This is all too easy, you know, in an occasional representation and you have this title of being in the society. Sometimes it's also beneficial to you too. So I, if that's the case, I think the society is what the society is giving us. It's way too cheap. And I think it is through this type of simple uh, definition of society that one feels th that you have lost the true depth and breadth of society. I believe that one must ensure that you can interact, you can be um, you can be part of the society in each and every day of your work. Uh, the challenges that it you know presents to you must be real. So to me, for every day, you know the twelve hours that I'm working, I believe, I think that is my society. That is my world. 
it, it has to force me to change the action. You know, if somebody's you know wanting to force me to change my choice, then I have to object to that. My work is on the way to protest. You know, I'm saying no to all the untruthful definition of world or society, as far as I see it. So your workshop becomes your world, your society. And yesterday, you also told us that, that this is also your politics. And your politics is also within your workshop, and it is also your job. Can you also explain about this? You know, this concept actually is not mine. It actually is Lang Sai's. I very much agree to um, his view about politics. You know, we often think of politics. You know, it is different from the politics that we often uh, think. One, on the one hand, is the power to distribute uh, resources and, and um, positions and power. That is the politics that we often see. For example, you know, some uh, governments or some uh, parties who distribute uh, certain resources and in such distribution uh, formulates uh, certain power. And this is a system uh, that perhaps put in some order. You know, I think this is po politics. So I think that if you want to do something and you clearly know uh, that it is politics, then this is really, you know, um, a, a cliché. You know, you must at least doubt what is existent. So when you, for a long time, question uh, something that you feel doubtful or questionable or unagreeable, you know, when you start doubting that, then you, in fact, is involved in politics. You know, when I hear you say that, you know, in fact, what is it that you are searching for? What is it, uh, what type of uh, environment are you searching for, for art to become independent? And f what is it that you are looking for, for art to become your independent society or your independent world in which you can exist independently? Or perhaps have your own independent revolution? However, uh, you have to first look at art to find your perspective. On another hand, if art becomes so independent and you have always been considering uh, matters of art and uh, philosophy, then is this art uh, alienated from the world? Uh, does it mean that it is uh, creating its own um, form and its own environment that is delineated from the real world, and just like the old literary world is, you know, that that is totally away and separated from what true reality is. They are just looking for, you know, this um, abstract environment. Now, where can you find this art? Now I understand what you are trying to say. I also noticed that, you know, some people would, you know, have this view of contemporary Chinese art. This is just like um, that, you know, something that we had discussed. For example, the West, you know, France, you know, has a democratic society. And after the establishment of true democracy, then one can discuss general matters, you know, common matters. For China, you know, basically we do not have democracy as yet. And, you know, therefore, let's not talk about common matters. So the, the responsibility of the artist you know, has is that you must consider about democ democracy. If you do not, then basically you are a very selfish 
a very uh, you know like a like a um, uh, far too romantic uh, uh, you know lyrics or literary that hides in the mountains. You know, I think this job that we have comes with our role uh, as an artist. We all know that globalization brings, you know, other challenges. Various places, you know, a uh, culture of various places needs to be respected, you know, Africa, Middle East, China, etc. Well, I think um, it is within this larger context that we should fully respect the uh, uniqueness and the cultural identities of uh, various civilizations. Well, it sounds very lofty um, as an ethic, uh, but then the problem comes. You can only represent this particular locale and you can also speak, you can only speak in the way that this locale dictates and how on earth can you not be like one of them uh, in this particular local? So when we're discussing anything, we should actually just stop and think, Do you, are you coming from uh, China? So then, the, so then you can discuss this whole thing uh, within this per per parameter of um, this particular commission contract. Uh, we cannot actually go beyond it. So sometimes I think... Um, difference exists. Uh, it's an objective reality, and to turn it into a problem, to problematizing it, it's extremely complex. And secondly, my identity, my birth, my uh, facial features, they exist. Um, something that I cannot change. Um, but is this the only thing I can draw upon uh, to make a living? So I look really, really like withered, uh, increasingly, but I cannot, I, I cannot, uh, you know, um, avoid that basically. So in this sense, if you can only speak through your identity, which I think is very political. Thing so it kind of s obstructs you from to speak as a human being, as an artist. It, it's extremely simple. If we we often say that as an artist, I'll just give you two examples. When the first time I went to see an exhibition overseas, and I'll be suddenly moved by the particular piece of work in front of me. But prior to that, I had no idea where this person came from, its gender or her gender, the age of the artist, but I would be moved, I'll be touched. Um, I was thinking back then, perhaps this is the kind of artist I would like to be. But in that sense, I'll give you another example as well. Uh, we were just touching upon, uh, you know, um, you always say you I want to go beyond, transcend the identity as of ch ch contemporary Chinese artist. I want to just to be an artist. Do you really have to overcome it? Do you want to have more autonomy, universal um, universality? On the other hand, I'm an artist. It is also an identity. Um, as defined by Marxism. It's the division of labor basically dictates your social class. If you're a worker, if you're a farmer, if you're an army, a soldier in the army, you're an artist and you can also, can you also overcome the identity of an artist? Of course. Uh, when we were discussing this issue at, at Guggenheim Museum, I, I don't know if you remember this. Uh, today I would like also to discuss with you something that seems quite irrelevant. Uh, resurrection. Let's talk about it, resurrection. It's about um, Paul. When Paul was discussing Jesus, um, Jesus on the, cross, on the cross, he was not referring to a creaturely death. He was talking about when a birth 
something that new has to be born, something old has to, to die. Anything that stops, any old things that stop new items being born have to die in order to, to redeem the life of the new. So when a new subject is born, it is exactly in the same way. It has to be being towards death. And when Jesus comes down from the cross, he doesn't represent the Jews, he doesn't represent the Europeans, he doesn't represent the Greeks or the Americans. He doesn't even have a gender. He just has the man or human uh, concept. So in this sense, um, the concept is given uni universalism. So I think I have very small focus. And perhaps universalism, universality also exists in particular concepts. So when we are, for me, I'm not actually serving a particular area, region, and I don't have to really appear on behalf of a particular region or locale. Of course, each uh, region comes with a particular cultural context, uh, inheritance. This is, f this is a fact. So I always go to art museums and I also read catalogs and, uh, like in a particular uh, dynasty. All these sculpture from a particular historical period in China always moved to me. But we're talking about contemporary art. We're talking about other facts. And this particular fact is that you really have to be able to use a simple or let's say universal way of speaking it does not truly really stop us from talking about our own identity and it does not stop us from talking about our different um, origins so we cannot but we cannot really talk only talk in this way or we cannot really just judge um, by these set of behavioral uh, criteria. So, I mean, they don't have the notion of nation. I mean, contemporary art is its own republic. So, in this particular republic, everybody is equal. I really love the way you put it. Contemporary art is its own republic. It's a wonderful way of putting it. So, when I saw your earlier works, especially your video um, works, including also your uh, theater pieces and performance art pieces. And I see there are two directions or two trends, so to speak. First is to go uh, by using media, through media, and also to think about uh, movement. And the second um, trend is that you try to uh, when you talk to uh, Hans uh, Ulrich uh, Obrist, the, the relationship between art and science, you're also sort of a scientist, but there's another angle. You also have an anthropological uh, perspective. Uh, every time I cast my eyes on your works, also n notice that how you study um, the humanity. And I think this is a very important perspective because when you go to Kafa in Beijing, they also have a uh, department of anthropology and human studies. And But these two perspectives, when they overlap, it also brings about the relate. It also has to bear on um, society as a whole. I think your works are basically reflections on human beings and their environs and their changes perhaps also are you know related to the transformation of the particular nation they belong to as well as their personal circumstances I'm you're not giving us a narrative or a story or sort of teaching us about what is what society is but it's about behavioral patterns of society that I can say that um, I sometimes often have been asked a question like that. Are you interested in other disciplines and areas of knowledge? It's, it's also kind of a process. Um, 
we were trained, uh, we received very systematic training in the art system. Um, in the 80s, I didn't know anything, any like means of expression uh, beyond oil painting. I've, I've told the story over and over again. My, my uh, Mr. Chen Chen Tian, in the, my, 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 when he brought a lot of uh, images back from the United States, where he was a visiting scholar, and a lot of the images, there was a one piece that. Um, he said this was an installation piece, and, and my I can't find it in my vocabulary in, in my in my entire universe of knowledge, and I was extremely shocked. But this shock also brought me something. It is extremely dangerous to live in what is known. Man always assumes that he can just relax in what is known to him, but the small thing can just happen and take that uh, force certainty away. And for me, that is an extremely unforgettable experience. So ever since I came into uh, um, CAFA, I started to try and get to know things that I that was not known to me. So it kind of starts to also impact my work. So from then on, I started to realize what do I not know? So we, we used to know quite in a narrow sense that art is about humanity. You just basically resort to history, poetry, literature in search of certain possibility. But then it suddenly occurred to me that I was very new to science. So I started to get to know about science and overcome my fear uh, for uncertainty, unfamiliar, uh, taking unfamiliar steps. The first book I read was Grey Systems. The second one was about um, the revelations of microscopic physics. And the, both the books really, really shocked me. And so basically, it's about the nature of light. People have been discussing whether it's uh, particles or it's waves. So basically, uh, it took two generations to actually prove that light is both um, particles and um, and and waves. So this is a very important f physical discovery. So this has a fundamental sort of influence, shaping influence on my entire cognitive um, approach. So if you think you put yourself in the context of the entire spectrum of human knowledge, in that particular background, we can say it is a very real, how do I put it? It is a very equal, egalitarian thing. Can we also pause to think and come back to art? Since art is a constitutive part of human knowledge, can we also change perspective and try and illuminate art with the entire body of human knowledge? This, I think, is also possible, feasible. It's, it's not life-threatening at all. You, you just have to give up that particular fear for what is not known to you. And I think I kind of overcome that fear. I took that first step, and I don't think I have run any risk, and I'm still having a good life. I mean, of course, I gave up the, um, the comfortable world that is known to me. It, it, it didn't really unnerve me. It did bring about certain challenge. Um, I mean, I chose other media. I always want to keep myself in a multimedia state. Um, in fact, I actually I have a very simple idea, which is when you are surrounded or when you're working on something, you always have some people questioning the... Um, singularity of your work, that's very important. Otherwise, artists are easily trapped into complacency, 
self-importance. Um, so can we put it this way? Other areas of knowledge, other fields give you at least a basic starting point, modesty. Only in this particular state of modesty can you actually understand your difference, which is crucial. To, it questions the um, feasibility, the, uh, the correctness of your own work. So if you're, you keep yourself in this state of being constantly challenged, uh, questioned, I think that's how I see contemporary art. This is how I understand contemporary society and politics, but of course I'm not imposing this on other people. I'm not thinking other people should follow exactly the same approach as I do. Perhaps it's a bit of slow. I'm, you know, I have to just be industrious and from multimedia, from multimedia setting, I would say I started to uh, see your works. I always from performance from video, from movie, from, from in, to, to get to know, to get acquainted with your work. But recently, uh, this has also included sculpture, paintings. And back when we were thinking about, you know, the portfolio of exhibition pieces, you also mentioned installation and painting and we start to discuss film and theater. Uh, a lot of people were basically saying, oh, I, I know, uh, get to know Wang Jianwei through his video works. And they also say that your sculpture, your paintings, they were like, uh, is this the, still the same Wang Jianwei that we know? So they kind of started to change their perception of you. They also said that, uh, um, through your new works, uh, they can start to reflect on form and formalism. And is, is Wang Jianwei sort of deracinated from society, from concrete reality, has become a sort of a politic free, politics free, uh, sort of multimedia, abstract artist. Is that the case? Uh, just to focus on form. Uh, but when we, we've also talked about this before, through form, through, we can also discuss uh, reality, society, etc. Um, I've also I've touched on this before, I think. So familiarity is not politics. Familiarity is corruption. When something is obvious, is giving you an obvious uh, judgment, then when you are faced with a difficult situation, I think, maybe real, real, a revolution will take place. And this is how I understand politics. For example, uh, once there was a curator who came to my studio, and we were discussing the things that we've been talking about. And there was somebody behind me. I, wrote, I drew a few lines on in one of my paintings. This is my politics, I said. He said he was very confused back then. And this is how I see it. When you are faced with a, any particular issue, you will jump to a conclusion, oh, this is politics. I think that is politics. This politics for me is cliched. When you are faced with something that you cannot easily judge, reach a con quick conclusion about, it actually forces you to think about real politics. And if you think what politics questions things that are obvious or self-evident, that speaks for itself, if things that are just readily there for you to jump to a quick conclusion about, then so my sculpture is basically to try and sort of put people's perception about me into that kind of state. I'm just showing people my real state 
when I'm at work, I'm not just trying to be difficult. Um, so it, it kills the author in the first place. When my work, in my work, you cannot detect my own image. I think the, the one concept that is crucial to contemporary art is its, its transcendence of the individual. If you cannot even transcend the individual, so that isn't art just a personal reduced to a personal narrative. And so what you have come up with an individual artist is to th go through sort of like a my struggle, personal struggle to reach a certain accumulative state. So, I mean, Michel Foucault two decades ago basically told you that the author is dead. I think the subject of contemporary art is not the artist, it's it's the work that the artist has created through the artist's labor, and it doesn't have to be signed. Um, so I think that is um, the basics of contemporary art. I mean, form, formalism, politics, they're just too conceptual. So what is this particular thing, after all? I mean, we've discussed this before. Art, if art is only instrumental, then we return to the previous question. It can only reflect other stuff. The work is only reflective of Wang Jianwei's view on society, this particular artist's particular view on a particular issue. So then the work is devoid of subjectivity, and art doesn't exist in this case. So. I think this would be an issue. You know, does art really exist? So, from this perspective, I think it is, you know, maybe there is a very important uh, consideration. You know, a sub, uh, art as a subject must have a larger meaning than a tool. So, what is this? It is something that must be identifiable, and it is something that should be consistent, meaning that if this object or this thing is uh, put in Hong Kong, it becomes a good thing, and when it's placed in Guangzhou, it becomes a bad thing, and it becomes something else when it's put in you know, another place. Now, I recall that I was talking to two reporters yesterday, you know, I, I talked about um, the, the, there's no need to interact. And I was saying that uh, contemporary art does not need interpretation, does not need a media for things that needs interpretation. I think it is absolute corruption. Let me give you an example. When you listen to some music and you're deeply touched, how uh, when somebody says, you know, why is it that you are touched? Then you get told uh, for two hours a story as to how sad you are, etc. And then you say, now I understand. Or you know, when you face you know an, a piece of art, and then you know people would say you know let's talk and you talk for four hours and then you said you understand what the art is if that's the case then the art itself you know is is ineffective you know it is the things you know the the discourse that is around the piece of art that becomes effective and i think this is corruption i am only talking about my own views of this. So I think artists offer shoulders, you know, this uh, this, bur this uh, uh, burden of ethics. You know, you must interpret, you know, what your work means as if the form is not important. You know, just like we had just now discussed, you know, if the art itself has its own oncology, then how is it that we should, how is it that we we can ignore its form? You know, if we can, you know, only discuss about art through politics, through philosophy, to society, or maybe even through trends and fashion and etc. You know, and, and if only through this, 
can art becomes effective. And if the situation is that, you know, if art does not have a form and therefore it cannot be discussed, you know, in a standalone, you know, in its singularity, then I think we are going down the road, the route of, uh, of a party, you know, of corruption. And we're, in fact, knitting a very sad story. I think this is called entertainment, rather. Therefore, I think, you know, if we are find effectiveness through the tears of ethics, then we should dry our tears. You know, after the tears are dried, you know, does your art still exist? And if it does, then it is it is protected by ethics. This is my own personal view, meaning that through form, art can achieve its uniqueness and art relies on form. You know, I think uh, you talked about independence. I think, you know, this actually should be a concept that is non-existent. Because it seems that, you know, something that nobody wants is called independent. As a matter of fact, you know, things exist because they are not independent. You know, I'd rather talk about the concept of freedom. Freedom is a very important concept, and there's no such thing as overall freedom. There's only partial freedom. You know, as when the moment when everybody consents, then you have freedom. And the ultimate freedom is that you do have the freedom to say no. Now, that's a very good example. It's not my example, it's Chisha Ke's example. At that time, he was joking. He said, um, after uh, the Soviet Union uh, collapsed, uh, many Jewish people wanted to uh, move to Israel, and police were checking their papers. And the police sometimes um, were not very unhappy, uh, were not very happy. They said, you know, did the Soviets treat you well? You know, did you have houses? Did you have a salary? And yes, yes. Then why is it that you want to immigrate? And they said, this in fact is the reason why I wanted to immigrate. This is their interpretation of perfection, their interpretation of freedom. For anything that is given to me, I have the freedom to say no. And this is a decision that you can make. You know, if everybody is making this decision, and if everybody can have the judgment to say no, then this is freedom. Now we still have five minutes, so I think we can take uh, one to two questions. Ching. How do you uh, understand, how do you interpret the concept of in implementing, doing? Now, in my uh, article at Gogenhan, the second portion uh, discusses implementation. And I use the concept of rehearsal. I understand my sta my statues, my uh, paintings to be my drama. Now, if you look at my work, you will discover that in all of my work, I do not co make considerations from the perspective of the media. This is the first consideration is uh, when you consider implementation, the first thing you do is that you do not consider what is the uh, objective of what you're doing. Rehearsal has a very important and yet very simple logic. Basically, the director would say, yeah, okay, one more time. Why is it that he would say that? You know, perhaps he has already rehearsed for that for a hundred times. Then why is it that he still wanted one more time of rehearsal? Now, a very important concept is that whatever happened yesterday is no longer meaningful. 
and future has not yet started. But you have to start your action. You have to take action now. This is a very important concept of implementation. You're not being absorbed by traditions, and you're not working for uh, corruption in the future, and you have to take action now. This is how I understand uh, implementation. This is how I understand uh, rehearsal, and I think this is very important for contemporary art. I'd like to ask uh, Guggenheim a question. As you know, such an, a museum collecting uh, Asian art, especially Chinese art, uh, what kind of a system is it? What kind of mechanism is it? For example, in the last 50 or maybe 100 years, Chinese art and Asian art has been influenced by a lot of Western trends. Now, as Guggenheim, you know, collecting Chinese art, uh, are you doing that within uh, the European art uh, mechanism to try to discover uh, Chinese art, or are you respecting, you know, Chinese art systems itself? Is that a question for me? Yes. Well, to me, Guggenheim Museum does not collect Chinese art. For the foundation, we are considering uh, the, the changes that are occurring in the greater China uh, concept. That has to do, you know, such changes has to do with contemporary art, with uh, language, with culture, etc. However, Guggenheim Museum also collects works from uh, uh, artists of various places in the world. Well, the first exhibition being a personal exhibition, uh, we consider you know this angle. We start from art, from the angle of the artist to consider this exhibition and this activity. Most importantly, we are considering cooperating or partnering with artists on new works, uh, taking into considering, uh, taking into consideration all the changes that are taking place in the world, including China, including New York, um, including uh, those changes that are within Guggenheim. You know, these are things that we are considering. We do not consider only China. We consider uh, greater China, uh, Chinese, as well as uh, global trends. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I cannot, no, I do not speak on behalf of Guggenheim, but I think the question is very, very interesting because uh, yesterday I was talking to a reporter uh, who was talking, uh, and we were talking about uh, conversations or dialogues from the Buddhist perspective. And we were saying, you know, whenever you know you talk about Buddhism, people would ask you, as a Chinese, as an Asian, you know, how do you look at Buddhism? How do you uh, let Western people know about Buddhism? Yes, however, yesterday. Uh, we were saying, you know, a more interesting thing is that true Buddhism, you know, does not come with a country label. There's no such thing as a Chinese Buddhism or an Asian Buddhism. The true value is that it is um, for everybody, you know, it is universal. And ex this is exactly what we are trying to express, and the same applies for contemporary art. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wang. Thank you. Your Chinese is excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, we can, you know, I am so happy that we can continue to dialogue and continue to engage in art. Thank you. Thank you very much.